Finally, those capitalist pigs will pay for their crimes, eh? Hey, comrades, hey? Austin, we won. Oh, groovy, smashing, yay, capitalism. Fight Club wasn't born in a dive bar parking lot. It sneered into existence back in 1995, when author Chuck Polinick expanded a short story about the malaise of consumerism, blue-collar fascism, and horrific daddy issues into a searing 200-odd pages of disaffected masculinity. After selling the publishing rights for a whopping $6,000, and a blink and you'll miss it first hardcover run, 20th Century Fox snapped it up and rolled the dice with director David Fincher and an all-star ensemble as they strived to mine commercial gold from the pig-iron veins of disenfranchised nihilism. Yeah, that didn't work out. Shortly before its disastrous premiere in 1999, the studio's head of marketing sighed, Congratulations, you've made a movie with so much blood no woman will watch it, and so much male nudity no man will. It was bold and in no way beautiful, a tonic for the sons and heirs of nothing in particular that proceeded to die a thousand deaths at the box office. But all of this was just a prologue. Via word of mouth and retrospective acclaim, Fight Club is now arguably the most famous creation of everyone involved. Rounding out what I like to call Fincher's Ugly America trilogy, his take on Fight Club is an acid-coated enema dripping with satire. I'm not here to review a film we've all seen. For what it's worth, I like it as much as the next person, and not as much as the fringes of the internet who've completely missed the point. The, 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 pre, the proto incel. Exactly. Um, whilst also shaking my head at the laboured re-evaluations that try to frame it as some kind of misogynistic, emotionally stunted Karl Marx for meatheads, most of which seem to willfully ignore every ounce of social commentary, homoerotic subtext, and blatant thematic telegraphing throughout. You were the all-singing, all-dancing crap of the world. With such a devoted fanbase and a groundswell of eventual success, the question is, why wasn't this the dawn of Chuck Polinick's media saturation? Well, it's not like folks haven't tried. Focusing on the books I've read, here's a breakdown of every up-in-the-air and unproduced oddity trapped in a post-Fight Club purgatory, and the dreadful sequels you've hopefully avoided. Technically Polinick's first completed novel, Invisible Monsters follows a young model reeling from the loss of her career and identity after a gunshot blows her jaw off. Following Fight Club, Hollywood immediately came calling for this, but after a gestation period going on two decades, all we've got to show for it is the remixed version of the novel that reinstates the originally non-linear structure, and a fever you can't sweat out by Panic at the Disco, an album chock full of lyrical allusions to this book. There was a strong push in the 2000s to get a film off the ground, complete with a failed grassroots publicity campaign to mobilise the fanbase. Legion writer Jennifer Yale is rumoured to be taking a crack at making it work for television, and that's all we have to go on. As soon as you know what this book is about, you immediately understand why 2001 wasn't the best year to pitch it as a movie. There was a screenplay by Jake Paltrow, the casting was well underway, locations were being scouted, and then 9-11 happened. This fatal blow may seem ridiculous until you remember that Survivor chronicles a former death cult member hijacking an airplane and recounting his life story into the black box recorder before he inevitably crashes. My bad. Shut it down. This is Shut it down! Worse. That's it! Set to be helmed by I Am Legend director Francis Lawrence, he's finally wrestled the rights back from Fox in the wake of the Disney merger, and as of November 2019, it's in early talks to become a TV series. A sordid tale of a sex-addicted con artist who stages choking incidents to gain the favour and lifelong connections with those that save him, Choke is one of the most accessible and instantly gratifying reads on this list. 
as well as being the only other film to cross the Polonek finish line. And it isn't very good. It's got a strong cast. Sam Rockwell, Kelly MacDonald, Angelica Houston, and a pre-community Gillian Jacobs, but they never find the pulse of this twisted, tragicomic mashup. Adapted and directed by Clark Gregg, yes, the same one who plays Agent Coulson, he lacked the confidence, budget, and vision to deliver anything but the most bare-bones translation of the text. Not to sound too harsh about a directorial debut, but this feels like a no-budget sex comedy, rather than an exceedingly dark look at loneliness and addiction. The sexual compulsion and depravity required to honour the story is cut down or outright excised, leaving the audience with an amateurish missed opportunity that mistakes cheap for sleaze. Maybe just watch Don John or Shame instead. A journalist accidentally kills his wife and child when reading them a lullaby. Unbeknownst to him, he'd recited an ancient culling song, a simple verse that ends the life of anyone who hears it. Polinek has been extremely proactive in trying to get Lullaby made into a film, launching two modest but successful crowdfunding campaigns over at Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Since achieving its goal back in 2016, it sat in development hell for four years. After multiple delays and radio silence, the most recent update as of the time of this video was published on January 21st, 2020, and simply states, Yes, this film is going to be made. We have every intention of making this movie. We're just ensuring that when production actually starts, we are completely and totally prepared. Written as a woman's journal charting her husband's coma after his suicide attempt, Diary is Polinek's first outright foray into psychological horror, and I can't find a single piece of information regarding any attempt to move this story into a different medium, which is a shame. With the popularity of anthology series such as The Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, as well as more recent efforts such as Channel Zero, Shudder's Creepshow, and Black Mirror, this collection of repulsive short stories seems like perfect fodder for the format. Alas, even as numerous film adaptations have been circling the rumour mill since 2008, when ex-drummer director Cohen Mortier was attached, who always seemed like a perfect fit for this brand of unfilmable hideousness, nothing more has come of it. The last word came from Polinik himself when he tweeted that funding had been secured, back in 2013. Since then, nothing. A divergent, contradictory, and extremely odd fictional biography, Rand is a noxious blend of Crash, Strange Days, Huckleberry Finn, and Rabid. Some time ago, James Franco was handed the reins and, given his track record for rushing out underwhelming or outright awful directorial projects, maybe it's for the best that nothing came of this. A porn star tries to sleep with 600 men in a row, an event told from the perspective of this sex worker, and the numerous men waiting in line at this organised orgy. Okie dokie. There was word of a Maltese production company making it with Tom Sizemore, but following a spate of troubling accusations and a public fall from grace, that version is all but dead. Polinek has always envisioned it as a play, so while you wait for that, you should track down Sex, the Annabelle Chong story, a documentary that acts as a substantial influence on the novel. It's peculiar to see such a successful author with so few adaptions to their name, and even more bizarre to consider just how many spurned attempts there have been to change that. Financial viability is an obvious concern, lest we forget the poor theatrical performance of both film translations to date. Another issue is the distinct authorial voice Polinek carries from one novel to the next. Whether it's his emphasis on tweaking and repeating phrases ad nauseum, 
I am Jack's cold sweat. I am Jack's inflamed sense of rejection. I am Jack's complete lack of surprise. Or his penchant for littering his dialogue with research and rambling trivia. Ancient peoples found their clothes got cleaner when they washed them at a certain point in the river. Oxygen gets you high. To make soap, first we render fat. Their signature presence in every single book wears thin fast, and would most likely come off as derivative when pitted against Fight Club. Ah uh, yes, the ultra-violent, angst-ridden shadow of that first sleeper success. Beyond the extremely rubbish video game that seems to think the source material was all just foreplay leading up to Fred Durst punching Meatloaf, Tyler Durden lives on in a series of lesser-known sequels written by Polinek himself. And in a twist that's probably shocking to no one, the official follow-ups to Fight Club are skull-mashingly shit. Rather than going in-depth on the unforgivable awfulness of each of these tomes, I'll just give you a summary of what Fight Club 2 and 3 bring to the table. It's revealed Tyler Durden is a subconscious parasite that can move between the minds of multiple men. Robert Paulson digs his way out of his own grave, living on as a lobotomized zombie, despite, you know, this. Project Mayhem has turned into a global murder cult, branching out into ultra-violent franchises such as ISIS. Marla enlists a group of terminally ill hackers before storming Tyler's compound with an army of prematurely aging children. And in a coup de grace of pretentious wank, Polinick appears as himself to break the fourth wall, keep the plot moving, and deus ex machina things along. Fight Club 2 ends by disappearing up its own meta asshole, as a group of angry entitled fans storm the writing sessions for the final issue of the comic and demand a dumber ending because they only saw the movie and don't understand metaphors. Tyler Durden then breaks this already broken fourth wall and shoots Polinek in the head. Fight Club 3 is even less comprehensible, and is all about the narrator changing his name to Balthazar, undergoing plastic surgery to look like Tyler, and getting caught up in a sexual pyramid scheme intent on spreading a virus across the globe. There is also a magical portal hidden in a picture frame that transports people to heaven. These books are self-referential, smug continuations of something that categorically did not require expansion. They reek of such chin-stroking condescension towards anyone who liked the original that they may genuinely be two of the most hateable books ever conceived. Hey, even the Mona Lisa's falling apart. In the novel Choke, the protagonist opines to himself, Picture anybody growing up so stupid he didn't know that hope is just another phase you'll grow out of. While I don't keep up to date with his newer works, I still cling to the thought of someone taking any of his eyebrow-raising stories, kicking them into serviceable shape, and affording them the time, editorial attention, and money required to create something great. David Fincher proved you can apply discipline to chaos and deliver a subversive knockout. Then again, we've also seen how underwhelming and outright awful things can go in the wrong hands. As much as my reading habits have moved on, and after so many years with such slim pickings to show for what little investment remains, I still hold out hope for life after Fight Club. An enormous punch in the ear for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire MD, and Nicholas Lair Revere, and a dog-eared IKEA catalogue for all these wonderful folks who support us over on Patreon. So what are your favourite books by Chuck Polinuk, and are there any recent efforts I've missed that I should check out? Let me know in the comments, and feel free to just chat away about Fight Club. As always, the best way to support this channel is to share this video, like, subscribe and leave a comment, and feel free to click the link in the description below to check out our Patreon and the various reward tiers available there. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is In Frame Out.